Well, good morning. I'm just talking a lot. This <laughs> I couldn't hardly hear myself thinking. Good to have everyone this morning. Good to be here. And we got one thing to do today. What's that? We got to worship the Lord. That's it. Amen. Amen. Got a few announcements. Words cannot express how thankful I am for our church family during this time. Brother Biden, the service was beautiful, and your support and prayers have helped us through this. Thank you for the church leaders, my ladies, and all the, for the, the meals they provided for our family. We're truly thankful for you all. Please continue the prayers to help guide us as we try to find our new normal. There are so many of you who have I feel I should get a personal thank you. Just know you have all touched our hearts, and we appreciate you. Love, Stacy, Tracy, the boys, Mark, Liz, and the girls. This Kim and the kids, Jessica, Daddy, and the kids, Ethan, Kay. I pray that with them still in their lives. No junior church today, and the big one is no junior church. For the summer, June, July, and August. So can we get some things ironed out on the teaching schedule? So. Do we have any more announcements? Church camp. I got, I got one. Uh, okay. Church camp? Yes. So, y'all, if uh, you have a student who's planning on participating in church camp, and again, I want to stress this do not make money the issue. Uh, so many members of our church have stepped up and uh, already offered support but we also want to say is that the camp never turns anybody away who can't pay we want every kid who wants to go to go to church camp um, i mean of course here's the big thing i also want to say is if your kid does go to church camp we know they're great for two weeks afterwards you know i want to admonish parents and encourage y'all and grandparents you know let's keep that fire stoked let's let's keep our kids going but if, if your student is going to church camp i really need to know who's going. I've got, I think, three? Three, four. We've got four. Uh, and we haven't turned ours in. Out of the 25 kids who signed up. <laughs> so please get those in as soon as possible so we can get their name on a list because we're going to start putting them in their groups, things like that. Pray for me. I'm dean of camp for two of the weeks. So, uh, <laughs> but we really, really uh, would like that to happen. Um, we also know we have some guests this morning, so we want to let y'all know here we take the Lord's Supper every single Sunday, and we take it as a family. So um, when communion is passed out this morning, um, hold the, the emblems, and we will take them all together uh, after they're passed out. So. I'd like to just announce that the Collins family, remember, we're going to have a uh, benefit for the Collins family at Senior Citizens next Sunday. There'll be a lunch and there'll be an auction of, uh, I think, some pies. And they're gonna have other things if you want to build something or you know, if there's a special picture you want to bring, can they get auctioned off? But there'll be things there that, that, that can raise money for the Collins family. That's next Sunday at six. That's CADC. Yes, sir. few more announcements. We're looking for volunteers for the We Worship. See Miss Deanna. Good morning, info. Baby shower. Let's drop in it for Justin, Brittany, and Christian. June the 6th from 1 30 to 3 30. Where's that at? Here. 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 Okay. <laughs> Here at the church. And church building is Mrs. Silver Carrier. I don't know if anybody was a carrier of silver. <laughs> but anyway. Well, the chief. The chief civil work here, you inform Mike Lynn and I or something. Okay, okay, okay. And tonight, we're going to have fun day Sundays. Uh, we are activity here. We are meeting here tonight at 6 o'clock. So, uh, ice cream. Bring a topic. And anything that goes on ice cream. So, just bring it. We'll see if we can't figure it out how to take care of that. All right, any other announcements? <coughs> We stand we'll do your scripture. We'll get started. Mark 13, 33. Be on guard. Keep away. away. For you do not know when the time is. Amen. Our Father.
Father, we thank you for another day of life. We thank you for the blessings that you graciously bestow upon us. Father, just the blessings we have of being assembled here this morning. Father, the plan that you had for us uh, started back many years, many years ago. And, uh, for us to be redeemed by you, and by your son. We thank you so much, Father, that we had that opportunity. We thank you so much this morning for the opportunity we have to be in your service. Sing, Father, to you, to give you praise, to give you praise to you, Father, to hear your word proclaimed, and Father, just to be uh, energized again to live the lives we need to live. Father, we pray for those, uh, the, our lost loved ones. We pray for their families. We pray for care. Father, many on our prayer list, we lift them up. We thank you for all the things you do for us, so many things we take for granted. Be with us this morning in these services. They are yours. In Christ's name we pray. Yeah, he's singing praises rising. <laughs>
been 41 years since the miracle on ice. Sports Illustrated called it the greatest sports moment of the 20th century. Millions of older sports fans remember Al Michaels of ABC and his pronouncement at the end of the game, do you believe in miracles? Yes. The American Olympic hockey team, composed entirely of amateur players, had defeated the heavily favored Soviet juggernaut full of paid professionals. Try it. May we ask how one measures triumph in the field of athletics. The greater your opponent, the greater your triumph. The greater the difficulty of your task, the greater your triumph. The longer the struggle to achieve victory, the greater your triumph. In this lens of athletic triumph, we may also measure the greatness of the triumph of the cross. How great was the opponent? The cross was the triumph of mercy over the justice of the Lord God Almighty. How difficult was it to achieve? The cross took the life of Jesus, the only sinless man, as an atonement sacrifice for us. How long did it take? It started with God's first contact with Adam and continues through the cross till the day when Christ returns, essentially the entire history of mankind. Communion is a memorial to this achievement. It is not a trophy. Trophies get put on shelves and gather dust. It is a memorial of what it took, for, for we partake of the body and the blood of Christ in memory of the price paid. The symbol of triumph of God is a symbol of sacrifice. It is also a reminder to us that we should go and do likewise, for we are to be merciful on earth. As the Apostle James told us in James 2, 13, For judgment will be mercy, merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Therefore, before you partake this morning, examine yourself. See if you are following the example of Christ in giving mercy. If you are, then know that mercy triumphs over judgment and that God will be merciful to you on the day of Christ's return. The merciful will need no other lesson. Father, we're thankful for this time of service and that we can remember the sacrifice you made for us. So we take of this love that represents your broken body and pray for the man of pleading in your sight. In God's name, amen. Amen. Lord, as we continue this prayer, you say this cup represents your blood and you just don't shed the many for the mission of sinners. <clears throat> Lord, we just thank you from the bottom of our heart for the great sacrifice you made for us when you died on the cross for our sins. Yeah. If not for the precious blood of the Lamb of God, which cleansed us from all unrighteousness, we would still be in our sins serving on his wrath. 
Lord, if we break from this cup today, we do it in remembrance of the sacrifice you made for us. For you are the third of the day. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Matthew 26, verse 26 says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And as the Apostle Paul reminds us, whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now this morning before the kids come forward, I would like to do something just in honor of those who've given their lives that we may assemble freely in a free nation. So at this time, if we would just all kind of bow our heads quietly, let's honor those who've given their lives for our freedom after we reflect on the one who died to give us life. this time I'd like to invite the kids to come forward. Hey Tristan, I'm glad to see you today. Alright, we've got a few coming. I want to ask y'all a question. Big surprise, right? Do you want to ask me a question first? Okay, go ahead. 
You want me to get back to you? Okay, I'll get back to you. I know you'll think of me. What does it mean to be brave? Standing up in the face of fear and danger. I think that's a great definition. You should write the dictionary. People writing it nowadays don't do a good job. I like it. And that's exactly, who here has ever been afraid in your life? What sort of things have you been afraid of? Scary things in movies? Like, a, yeah, clowns scare me too. I, I don't know why people dress up like that. Oh, jump scares? Yeah, things that hop out at you. Or you're watching a nice video and your dad shows it to you and then something scary pops on the screen. That's happened in our house a couple of times. Yes, I did it to Finn, yes. Yes, I did. Are there any other of my sins that you would like to confess? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, video game scary things, absolutely. What other things scare you? Creepy baby dolls. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay, go one more, one more. Okay, so y'all are talking about stuff you see in movies and TVs. Is there anything in real life that you're scared of? <laughs> Being eaten. Son, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to ask you. What scenario has your mother and I put you in that you're scared of being eaten alive? <laughs> because I can guarantee y'all personally, my wife has witnessed and possibly two or three of my other sons, we've never put them in that spot. The devil. The devil. That's a good thing. We're getting buried alive. Getting buried alive. Getting buried alive. Okay. <laughs> Has that almost happened to you, Josh? No, but I just hope you don't have to. I, you know what? That's always a good thing. Yeah, do you, do you wake up every day saying, Lord, thank you for today. Please let me not get buried alive. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Ash? When I make scary noises. Yes, I do. I do make scary noises. That doesn't really scare me. Yeah, you, you see, when you get older, it sort of doesn't get scary anymore. But don't worry, from the confessions of your older brothers, I did it to them too, so it's not just me. All right, well, I'm going to tell you all something I'm scared of. I don't like high places. I don't. I don't know what it is. I get squeamish. When I was a kid, we had this big pool in town, and we'd go swim in there, and the high dive would scare me. Like nothing. Have you ever watched those movies and someone's standing there and they're looking down and all of a sudden like something normal size tends to get bigger? That's what it would feel like for me. But you know what? I would jump off the high dive anyway. You know why? Well, I don't know about being brave, but facing your fears. And you know when you face your fears, sometimes the things you're afraid of. Now, being buried alive and being eaten alive, I wouldn't recommend facing those fears. But sometimes when we face the things that we're afraid of, it ends up being some of the most rewarding experiences. I'll tell you what happened to me. Growing older, I don't jump off high dives anymore. It just has lost its effect. But I found that getting up on high places has been helpful for me. For example, at one church we were serving at, they had to put projectors on the ceiling just like that. And there was only two of us working, and we had to build this scaffolding. And it's, it's like this big shaky ladder that you don't know if it's going to fall over even though you put it together. And I went up to the very top about 40 feet in the air, and it was scary. But guess what? We got the work done. And I had a neighbor. And one time, a tornado came through our town. Y'all might remember. Our, our older boys will remember that. And it blew some shingles off his roof. And there was about three of us working on it. And guess who they sent up to the top? I swear, when I was sitting up on top of the roof, I was clutching with my knees like I was riding a horse. But we got the work done, and it was rewarding because I was able to serve my neighbor. Being brave doesn't mean you're not scared. Being brave means you're afraid, and you move forward anyway. 
And you said earlier, you know, you're afraid of the devil. One of the biggest weapons the enemy likes to use against us is fear. And fear makes things scarier than they really are. Don't get me wrong. There's lots of things that are scary. But when we face our fears, there's only one true way we can face our fears. When we pray and we say, Lord, I can't do this, but you can. Those things that we find are scary, we learn we can face anything through Jesus. Maybe. I don't know about being buried alive being fun. Don't rush to face that fear. Yeah. For you, because I'm not a roller coaster guy. <laughs> but you go do it. Okay, one more. What's up, Bash? Me too. But you sleep on the top bunk. No, now he's on the bottom. But you slept on the top bunk for like eight months. Because we have railing lines. Big heights. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, I want to let you know. You guys have got to go back to your parents now. But I want you to know I love you. And you could face any fear through Jesus Christ. What's up, Bubba? He has the same pants as you? Oh, my goodness. That's amazing, Tristan. Thank you for sharing that with me. <laughs> Something I've noticed as a trend in our society, and you might have noticed it too, is I think sometimes parents are well-intended but I believe there are parents out there who make life too easy for their kids that when their kids get older and face real challenges, they don't know how to do so. Y'all ever hear the term helicopter or lawnmower parenting? When we do things like that, what we do is, I think unintentionally, because I think the things we do, we do it with the best intent. But we unintentionally teach our children that life is going to give them whatever they want and it will be easy. I think sometimes we get that message mixed up in the church too. There are people I know in this world who honestly, truly, genuine belief, genuinely believe that when you give your life to Christ, suddenly things get easier. I want to tell you all something. Jesus never promised that. As a matter of fact... The scriptures tell us, if any of you thinks he is strong, watch out. For the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for a soul to devour. Jesus himself said, in this world, and some more modern translations put the word as trouble, but I like the word tribulation. In this world you will have tribulation. Meaning there will be trials. There will be things that take you to your very limit. There will be things that hurt you. Jesus even said in an earlier uh, uh, sermon, when they bring you before the governors and seek to stone and kill you. In this world, you will have tribulation, is what the master said. But he gave us a promise that went along with that. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. It is unrealistic of us as parents, as Christians, and as anything else to think that the world is going to always be sunshine and roses. Why? Here's the simple explanation. The world is in rebellion against its designer. God, in the beginning, when he had looked at all that he had made, called it very good. But because of our ancestors... Instead of listening to the voice and command of God, which wasn't burdensome, and choosing for themselves as opposed to allowing God to define it, choosing to define for themselves what was good and eating the, the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they broke the world. God told Adam, cursed is the ground because of you. We suffer death because of sin. And the world groans for its rightful creator. It trembles, it shakes, floods and fire and famine and earthquakes and tornadoes and, and so many other things happen because the earth itself knows that it's against the design of the original creator. We will face trouble in this world. What's more, we will not merely face trouble, we'll face opposition. 
Because when we decide to give our lives completely to Christ, we have an enemy who seeks to kill and steal and destroy. I'm here to declare to you today that Satan is alive and well. He is a thief and a liar and a murderer and has been since the beginning according to the scriptures. And we cannot underestimate our enemy. When you choose to live for Christ, there will be opposition. There will be trial, there will be tribulation, and there will be trouble. But be of good cheer, for our master has already overcome. This morning, and for some reason I just, I don't know, since I started growing my beard out a little longer, I decided to start shaving with a straight razor. I don't, I've never really liked the safety razors. They don't seem to cut as well. Well, today I wasn't being watchful in what I was doing. I was wiping down my razor blade and I cut myself shaving, but not on my face. As I'm sitting here wiping off the blade, I'm running it along and all of a sudden I feel a cut come across my middle finger. I wasn't being watchful. And several times throughout the Old and the New Testament, the prophets and the apostles, they tell us, be on guard. Jesus himself preached such messages. Why? Because when we're not on guard, we relax just a little bit. We give a little bit of slivers, just like that tiny cut on my finger, room for the enemy to come in and cut. And today when we go through Nehemiah, we're going to find that when he was trying to rebuild the wall, he faced opposition. But Nehemiah knew where his help came from. So before we get into our chapters today through Nehemiah, I would like us all to stand for the reading of the Word of God, and I'm going to read directly from Christ Himself. Luke chapter 12, verse 35. Stay dressed for action. Keep your lamps burning, and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast. So that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at the table. And he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this. That if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You must also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. And all God's people said, Amen. Please be seated. Why would Jesus say that? Now, I know a lot of people like to use those for end times arguments, and I think appropriately so. However, I'm going to tell you all something you may not already know. For some of us, the end is coming quicker than sooner. Death is an assurance in life because of the sin that we committed in the Garden of Eden. Jesus says be ready because the call can come at any minute. And even if he doesn't tarry and should come back, he wants to find those of us who are faithful, waiting, and ready. Amen. He gives an example in a parable of ten virgins. They were part of a wedding celebration, and they were to have oil lamps trimmed and ready for when the bridegroom came. Because in those days, <coughs> the groom could return for his bride at any minute, and if you weren't ready, you weren't invited to the feast. Well, five of them trimmed their lamps and put oil in them, and five did it. And the bridegroom was delayed. And at midnight, a shout of a trumpet came, and they said, the bridegroom is on his way. What do you think the five who didn't trim their lamps and have oil ready were doing? They were scrambling. As a matter of fact, the five who weren't ready approached the five who were ready and said, give us some oil from your lamps. And the five who were ready said, I can't. If we give you some of ours, there won't be enough for any of us. Go and buy some from the merchants. And so the five who were unready went and they found some oil. I don't know where you buy it at midnight in Jerusalem. I don't think there's a 24-hour oil stand. But when they finally found their oil, the door was closed. 
They were not permitted to enter in. Something I need you all to hear is Jesus wasn't speaking to those outside of the church in that particular sermon. He was speaking to faithful Jews. And now in our day and age, he is speaking to those who call themselves followers of Christ. If we are not ready, we will not enter in. Why? Because the enemy gives us a lot of things to look at. Some of us are like that dog from the movie Up. Telling a story that all of a sudden squirrel distracted. Well, some of us have got to, to work and, and toil and slave away for the shiniest new truck. Or the newest toy to go out on the weekend with. Or, or working for vacation or all these things. None of which, by the way, I'm saying are bad. But if we're not ready when the master calls, we're not getting in. If any of us think he is strong, watch out. For the devil prowls like a roaring lion looking for a soul to die. <coughs> he tells us to be on our guard. Jesus says in the very last days, the love of many will grow cold. This is why we have to stay on guard. And how do we stay on guard? Nothing else but through the word of God. Because he gives us the times and the seasons. He gives us the things to interpret. Through his word he tells us how to live. Moment by moment. Not just merely day by day. Submitting to his will. Surrendering to his desire instead of ours. Nehemiah chapter 4 tells us this. Verse 1. Now when Sanballat heard that they were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. And he jeered at the Jews and he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? i got to pause here for a minute. When I read this during my study this week, I don't know about y'all, but I thought of those, uh, you know, those old caricatures of the, the men with the big black top hat and the big curly Q mustache tying a lady to a railroad track. What are those feeble Jews doing? Or those superhero movies where the villain is giving a monologue. But that's just the way the enemy works, isn't it? People who think they're powerful in this life do not understand and often underestimate the power of Almighty God. And that's exactly what our enemy does. Satan is a creature in rebellion against his designer. He was not always who he is now. And his primary purpose and goal is to spread that rebellion. He underestimates God at every turn. He says, will they restore it for themselves? Speaking of the wall. Will they sacrifice Will they finish up in a day? Will they receive stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burn ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, Yes, what they are building, if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Now knowing all of this, verse 4 is the key. Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight. For they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. When we do the Lord's work, oftentimes he will send to us messengers in the flesh. But Nehemiah here is not stating that he will take care of the problem. Nehemiah, as this is happening, wrote down his prayer. He didn't try by his own might or by force of arms. He didn't write to the king who he was a personal friend of. He didn't petition the local government. He prayed to Almighty God. When opposition comes, church... This is what we must do also. 
It is not by our mind. It is not by our strength. It is not by passing laws or rules or anything else. <laughs> it is not by playing by the rules of the world that we will change anything, but by getting on our knees before Almighty God. James writes this, resist the devil and he will flee from you. How do we resist? We don't resist by picking up weapons of war. We resist by going to our knees. If I read the Psalms and I see all the things, and yes, some of the, the images, especially according to our sensibilities today, are disturbing. When he cries for the death of his enemies, here's what Nehemiah and what the psalmists and what David are doing. They're saying, Lord, I place my problem in your hands. And guess what? They leave it there. I heard once a wise woman of God, I don't remember her name, but she said this. When you give something over to God, he takes it and he puts it in the deepest part of the sea. And then he puts a sign up on the beach that says no fishing allowed. Y'all hear that? How often when we pray to God and we're on our knees, do we say, okay, Lord, take this from me. Take this from me. And then the Lord reaches out to take it and we pull it back in. We try to resolve the problems ourselves. We try to handle things on our own. But I'm here to tell you all something. You and I are not equipped to handle it. Amen. But God is. I've heard this expression, and I hate it, and I think it needs to die. <coughs> That God will never give you more than you can handle. Preachers have preached it from a pulpit. Never in the Bible does it ever say that. It says we will not be tempted beyond what we can handle. And the Lord will give us a way of escape. But in the very next book, Paul writes to the Corinthians that they despaired even unto death. But in doing so, they clung to the one who raises the dead. Oftentimes in our life, God gives us more than we can handle. And I'm going to tell you all this, and I'm going to repeat it until it sinks, and then I'm going to keep saying it some more. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to be weak. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, again, chapter 12, he said, I was given, to keep me from becoming conceited, a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from the devil to keep me from my arrogance. And I cried out to the Lord three times to remove it from me, but all he said, was my grace is sufficient for you. In your weakness, my power is made complete. So Paul stated after, therefore I will boast all the more in my weaknesses. For when I am weakest, then I am strong. You see, it's our weaknesses that invites God in to do his work. Because in our pride, our hard hearts push God away. But when we're at our most vulnerable, we are as infants before God. And let's think about it. Infants are the most vulnerable creatures on the earth. They can't take care of themselves. They can't feed themselves. Hey, when they're born, they're just these floppy pink things that we really don't know what to do with. And how do they help themselves? They cry out. And when they cry out, their needs are met. So my prayer for all of us is that we would be infants in our attitude towards Christ. Because in every single thing, I'm going to tell you, I am weak. I can't do anything on my own. When I wake up in the morning, I thank God for another day. And I pray for strength with each breath. And when I face opposition, I pray. And I anguish and I try to fix it on my own and I mess it up and I go back and pray and ask for forgiveness and truly give it over to God because I couldn't handle it. When we face opposition, our strongest position is from our own weakness towards God's strength. And so verse 6 says, so we built the wall. And the wall was joined together to half its height for the people had the mind to work. Do you see what prayer does? Prayer strengthens people. Prayer strengthens our resolve because we know who holds the issue in our hands. Excuse me, in his hand. 
We teach our children on Sunday morning sometimes to sing, he's got the whole world in his hands. Who's ever sung that song before? Why don't we believe it? If God's got the whole world in his hands, we just sang that in the song this morning. Then let him take every one of your issues. There is nothing too great for God's power and nothing too small for his love. That's Corey Tenberg. She said that. And it's true. We sometimes think we're bothering God. But what does James tell us? We have not because we ask not. And we ask and do not have because we ask wrongly. Christ comes to us in our vulnerability because it is then that we are not stubborn, we're not arrogant, we're not prideful, we're not trying to do things on our own. When we are at our weakest, Christ comes in and proves his power to us. And so the work gets done. And if I may say so, just as God breathed into the nostrils of Adam and Adam became a living being, when we give our lives to Christ, we become new creations, born again in Him. We have no life unless the Holy Spirit is within us. God gives us His very breath to dwell inside of us. He is more than just an interpreter for Scripture. He is more than just a help. He should be our very breath. Just as God breathed into Adam through Christ Jesus in baptism, we are born again and God breathes in us again and gives us full and abundant life. But it only comes when we surrender completely to it. There's this thing we don't understand in our country because we have a freedom streak and there's nothing wrong with it. But it's submission under authority. Or excuse me, freedom under authority. What I mean by that is the more I submit to Christ, the more free I am. Amen. And I've learned this through physical things. I'm so glad God gave us the elders of this church. And I'm pretty sure I annoy them with as many text messages and phone calls as I give them. But I want to submit to them. Because they're the leaders of this church. And as I submit to them, the more freedom I have. Why? Because I have the best interest of this church at heart. It's not about Brian. It's about all of us together as the body of Christ, submitting to the leaders as we are called to do. And the more we submit, the more freedom we have in our marriages. There's a reason why Ephesians 5.21 doesn't really have a big gap in between it in the original language. Submit one to another out of reverence of Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Then it goes on to say, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The more I submit to my wife, the more freedoms I have. Why? Because she knows I'm not going anywhere. I mean, heck, I'd be a fool to try. In my opinion, there is no better woman on this earth. No offense to anyone else's wives. I will fight you on this. I will never be able to do any better. As I submit to her, there's more freedom. There's a reason why my wife packed up and left and drove 1,450 miles with two small children based on the whim that God doesn't want us in California anymore. Praise you, Lord, for that, by the way. Because I submitted to him first, and I gave myself up for her, as the Bible told me. And she was able to trust me and submit to me in return. I'm going to tell you, it ain't been easy. We're small Southern California people, which means we grew up in a town of 199,000 people. We had a Walmart in our backyard. And every grocery and amenity and restaurant we could have wanted just within a few feet. But the more we submit to God, the more freedom he gave us. And he has broken chain after chain after chain. So we got to work as we submitted. That doesn't mean we haven't faced opposition. Let's take a look at what Nehemiah faced. Verse 7. When Sambalot and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem were going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they became very angry. Where's their arrogance now? 
And they plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. Do you see what happened? Opposition. Satan will not let us go quietly. And so we have to be on guard. And how do we stay on guard? By once again falling to our knees. Before they set a watch, they sat on their knees and prayed. I don't believe merely that prayer changes things. I believe that prayer is the breath in which we breathe. You might notice there's a pattern with Nehemiah here. Before he did anything, what did he do? He prayed. Before he went to fast, what did he do? Before he spoke to the king, when the king asked him what was wrong, what did he do? Before he went back to Jerusalem with all the favor of the king and God, what did he do? When opposition came, what did he do? Pray. Why is it an eight-year-old? And I love you, Brother Bob. Thank you so much. Y'all should repeat this too. What did Nehemiah do? Pray. Pray. We need to hit this home. How do humans learn? Repetition. The reason why I ask questions in church and I say it's okay to talk is because I want you to hear your own voice say it. Because the more we hear the words of God coming out of our own lips, the more we hear the things of God coming out of our own lips, the more we begin to take it to heart. Church, there's a reason why this says meditate upon the word day and night. And it's not like Eastern meditation where you empty your mind and sit and sing weird and foolish nonsense words. When it says in the scriptures, in Psalm 119, I will meditate on your word day and night. What he is literally saying is your words always going to be on my lips. I'm going to repeat it to myself. I'm going to say it over and 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 over. I think you get the idea. Because I need to be reminded of the goodness of God. Throughout the history of Israel, when Jor uh, the Israelites crossed the Jordan and the, the Jordan River stacked up, they pulled 12 stones from it. Why? To remember. Every day, still to this day, the Jews recite what's called the Shema, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Listen and obey, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. They say it twice a day. Why? To remind themselves. And the more we put God's word ever on our lips, the more it sinks in. Loved ones, it is not by our might or by our strength or by our power. It is by the word of God. When Jesus was tempted in the desert, we talked about it. How did he combat Satan when Satan came to oppose him? Through the word of God. Man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So when we pray, we're not merely uttering our requests. We are reminding ourselves of the promises and word of God. And being here in the buckle of the Bible belt, I'm going to tell you all, I've noticed something. Many believers, we don't know what this says. And I'm going to tell you all something just like they used to say on that show, Reading Rainbow, don't take my word for it. I want you to go home and test me against the word of God. And if I am in error, you correct me. But if you come to correct me, correct me only by the word of God. I'm not interested in opinion. I'm not interested in what our feelings and traditions are. I'm interested in the word of God because when I get home to see the Lord and I'm face to face with him, he's going to test me against his son. And I know his son through his word. Otherwise, I'm judged by his word. Let the word ever be on your lips. Pray continually. And let the Lord be your strength. Verse 10 tells us in Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There's too much rubble. By ourselves, we'll not be able to rebuild the wall. Isn't that what the enemy always does? You can't do this. Just give up. 
Just like he did to Jesus in the desert. Aren't you hungry? Command the stones. Test your father's love. Jump on down. Because your own word says this. He will not let the angels let you strike your foot upon a stone. Tell you what, you're here to save the world. Okay, I'll level with you. You bow down and worship me, and I'll give it all to you. Satan's still doing it to Jesus' followers to this day. And our power and our strength doesn't come by listening to the voices of the world, but only through listening to the voice of God. Amen. And so here's what happened. And our enemies said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. Our enemy is still speaking these words, church. At that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us ten times, You must return to us. Do you want to see what's happening here? Their fellow countrymen are trying to stop the work. And oftentimes in the church we see such division. Sometimes there are churches within the church, but we must remain one unified body because somebody who is a weak person in their faith will listen to the voice of the world and become afraid. But we must stand firm in the Lord because fear divides, Christ unites. And when we are focused upon the work of the Lord, the Lord will honor the work. Now, does this mean we're going to have a safe and easy life? No. Prophet after prophet. I mean, Jeremiah is one of my heroes. He preached for 40 years and yet had no single convert. And how did his life end in his reward? He was stoned to death after being taken captive as a hostage to Egypt. But he stayed faithful. And to this day, Jeremiah's words are still changing hearts. The work of God is not about us. It's about the kingdom. And all of us in this room, if we are sucking air saying we love Jesus, are called to build that kingdom. Amen. And when we get to the work, the enemy is going to creep in and he's going to sow division and fear. Nowadays, I'm going to tell you all, I'm just going to say this because I'm going to hurt someone's feelings. You're going to have to hear this. Nowadays, Satan is putting on our hearts the fear of death. As if we can stop it. We can't. We cannot stop death. Nothing you will do will stop death. Nothing. Sin leads to death. And all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. However, Jesus walked out of that tomb so I can have life. Whether I'm breathing in this world or in his presence in the next. Whom shall I fear? I know the shepherd and he lays down his life for the sheep. So church, fear will often make the problem bigger than it is. But I'm going to tell you, this is what we should fear more than anything. We should fear the one who has the power to give life and take it away. And not the fear that makes us afraid, but the, the fear that makes us drop to our knees in awe and wonder that the God who spoke and all things came into being loves us. That should change our hearts. That should draw us closer to him. And that is the fear that we should live by because there is no reason to be afraid in the fear of the Lord. Verse 13 says, So in the lowest parts of the space between the wall and open places, I stationed people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord. Do you see what he did there? He told the people to be vigilant, but he called them to remind them who called them to the work. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your homes. Have courage, church. The world is dark outside, but the light is coming that cannot be faded. And you are the light of the world is what Jesus said to that even should they try to extinguish us, just as when they thought they had won with Christ on the cross, the gospel will grow. The kingdom will grow. God's will will be accomplished. Take heart. And let us all stand together, united to the word. Verse 15 says, When our enemies heard that it was known to us, and that God had frustrated their plan, do you hear who took the credit? 
God had frustrated their plan. We all returned to the wall, each to his work. And from that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held the spears, shields, and bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah who were building on the wall. This is our job if we're in leadership. The elders of the church exist here to pray for you and to encourage you and to lift you up through the word of God. I'm here every Sunday to pray for you, to lift you up, and to encourage you through the word of God. And some of y'all have already experienced this. I'll go wherever I'm called, where the need is greatest. Your elders will do the same. But it's up to all of us to get the work done. I preach once a week. I can't be everywhere at once. I'm not in your homes. I'm not in your neighborhoods. I'm not in your places of business. But God wants to be there. And God has placed you there for such a time and purpose as this. Strengthen your arms and get to work. And we're here to lift you up. Verse 18. Each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who surrounded the trumpet was or who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall far from one another. In the place you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there, and God will fight for us. Who fights our battles, church? God. Who fights our battles, church? God. Who fights our battles, church? God. You do not have to lift a finger. God will fight the battle. But be vigilant. I'm reminded of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Listen to what he says here. Paul writing to the Ephesians. says, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Do you think Paul read Nehemiah often? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Our enemies are not flesh and blood, church. We have an enemy who wants to disrupt the work of the kingdom. But Paul, excuse me, Peter was told by Christ, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I still believe in that promise. Do you believe in it, church? That if the gates of hell shall not be or prevail against the church, let us armor up and get to work. Stay vigilant. Stand firm. Stand strong. The Lord your God fights for you. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. Stand firm, church. Now, as is often the case, when we stand up against a bully, the bully balks. Verse 21 tells us, So we labored at the work, and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at that time, Let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be able to guard for us by night, and we may be able to labor by day. So neither I nor my brothers nor my servants nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes, and each kept his weapon at his right hand. They stayed vigilant. Now, I'm going to tell y'all something. I believe this with all my heart. Satan is a puffer fish. Y'all know how puffer fish work, right? They blow themselves up to look bigger than they are to intimidate opponents. Now, don't get me wrong. You can't underestimate a puffer fish. Why? Because they're extremely poisonous. You try to ingest it, it will poison you and you will die. But compared to my God, Satan can do nothing against me. I don't need to eat it. I just need to stand firm. Y'all see where I'm going with this? I need to put on my armor every single day. When I wake up, I need to drop to my knees and clothe myself in prayer. Putting on the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth and the helmet of salvation. The shoes of the readiness of the gospel I've got to always be prepared for. The shield of faith to deflect the fiery darts of the evil one. And my weapon, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. 
And the final the weapon in that armor, prayer. Praying at all times. The work continued. The enemies didn't show their heads. Don't get me wrong, we're going to find out about it later. They did try to stop it still. Enemies from without and from within. But when we set our eyes on Jesus, there is nothing he can't do. Church, it's time for us to stop looking with gloom and doom at the world. The world has always been evil and it always will be. Why? Because anything in rebellion is against God and it will always try and chew up and spit out and devour those who are standing firm on the faith. But we don't have to fear. Because our God fights for us. Our God stands for us. Our God is for us. And if our God is for us, church, finish that off for me. <laughs> our weapons are not weapons of war built by human hands. Our weapon is prayer and the word. And when we do this, they may destroy our bodies, but our souls, sealed by the Holy Spirit, will stand forever in the presence of Christ. Amen. Who shall we fear? As we prepare to close today, i got some good news to share with y'all. You're going to get tired of hearing it, but I don't care. All of us, we know, have two problems. We have a sin problem which is our rebellion against God, and that sin leads to death. But God, rich in mercy, sent his son to live as one of us, perfectly obedient as we couldn't. And his son, when speaking the truth, was opposed for it. They nailed him to a cross, but they didn't know that that was part of the plan. Because in nailing Christ to the cross, he nailed our sin to the cross. He became the curse for us. They buried him in the ground thinking they had won, but three days later, he walked out alive and breathing, taking care of the problem that sin caused once and for all, death. He ascended to heaven, and someday he's coming back again. Are you living by that good news, church? Amen. Then why do we listen to the bad news outside? Turn off the bad news, get into the good news. He's coming back. And if you haven't gotten in on that good news this morning, I want to encourage you. Uh, I've got some folks who uh, volunteer weekly to, to stand and pray. If y'all would get up, um, you know, our elders will be coming forward. I'll be on the front row. But if you need prayer today, you don't have to come forward in front of everybody else, everybody watching. We've got some folks around the room. I want to encourage you. If you need to be strengthened, be like Nehemiah. Pray. Don't be ashamed to get prayer. Don't be ashamed to be broken and sick. This is the place to be broken and sick. But if you've never gotten in on that good news, what does the Bible say we must do? Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and to receive the Holy Spirit. That's Acts 2.38. You can get in on that good news this morning. God sent his son because he loves you, values you, and wants you. He wants to restore you and return you to his original design. And yes, you will have an enemy who opposes it. But with God on your side, there is nothing you can't face now. So today I want to encourage you. Get in on that good news. Live by that good news. Walk uttering the good news. Pray the good news. Do everything you can and stand firm in the face of the enemy. Because if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. Let's stand and worship him.
Can't talk to him for the ice cream. Or something going, something go under, something. <laughs> All right. Adam, you have to say something. Dear Father, we praise you. Thank you for the privilege and the freedom that we have that we can gather here in your name in the midst with all of our brothers and sisters and be in your presence. And Lord, we just thank you for the word that we've heard. We thank you for your truth. Help us to stand firm on your truth. As we go into this dark world, help our light shine for you, Lord. May you be glorified. Dismiss us now with your blessing. Bring us back to the next appointed time. And may you be glorified, Lord. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.